spring 1945. The Nazi war machine is slowly grinding to a halt as the Allies approach Berlin. In a few short months, the entire surviving German high command would face charges and trial for their heinous breaches of the Geneva Conventions, to which they were signatories before the war began. This is one of the greatest examples of international debate and diplomacy as we explore the Geneva Conventions. For being as widely accepted as they are today, the Geneva Conventions certainly have humble beginnings. It all began in the fields of Europe during Napoleon's conquest. Uh, this effort to humanize war was the product of um, a uh, sort of sense of international revulsion at the way uh, battles left human carnage behind. A Swiss gentleman from Geneva named Henri Dunant, uh, he wrote a book called A Memoir of Solferino based on his experiences of witnessing a terrible 1859 battle between French and Austrian forces. Dunant was so appalled by the fate of those left to die on the battlefield due to lack of proper medical care that he resolved to try and change the face of armed conflict. He then began a process that would lead to the signing of the first Geneva Conventions. European nations do get together uh, in Geneva, uh, representatives of various European countries. On August 12, 1865, 12 nations signed the first draft of the Geneva Conventions in Dunant's hometown of Geneva, Switzerland, after many days of intense debate. And they uh, create a, uh, the blueprint for an organization known as the Red Cross. This not only outlined the rules for humane war, but created an organization known simply by their symbol, the Red Cross, which is a humanitarian group dedicated to helping those in need, especially those affected by armed conflict. Hearing of Dunant's great success, American Clara Barton campaigned heavily for the adoption of the conventions in the United States, as well as the creation of the American Red Cross. Her efforts came to fruition in 1872, when the United States of America became a signatory of the conventions, and the American Red Cross was signed into being. Henri Dunant was awarded the first Nobel Peace Prize in 1899 for his contribution to the welfare of society. He died in 1902 at the age of 70, but his legacy lives on in his brainchild, the Geneva Conventions. As warfare evolved, the rules that guided it would need to be adjusted to account for these new methods of conflict. The Geneva Conventions would reconvene for that purpose three times, the first being just before the advent of World War I. Known as one of the bloodiest wars in human history, the First World War saw many advances in the methods of warfare. In 1906, it was decided that the Geneva Conventions of 1864 needed some updating, especially in the vein of naval warfare, where the first conventions laid few guidelines. With the official title being Second Geneva Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of Wounded, Sick, and Shipwrecked Members of the Armed Forces at Sea, this document specifically centered upon the issue of modern naval warfare, which had come into its own during the last 50 years. As well, Dunant's Red Cross was solidifying itself as a vital international organization and was hard at work during the war, caring for those who had become wounded or sick. However, the septic conditions in which the Great War was fought certainly hindered the effectiveness of their services. After the experiences of World War I, the world found that it had a new problem in warfare, prisoners of war and how they should be treated. Once again, it called for the convening of nations in Switzerland in the year 1929 for a new draft of Geneva documents, officially titled Third Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war. It would be significantly updated in 1949, but was first signed in 1929. Among those in attendance were diplomats from Germany, as well as most other countries who would participate in World War II. Ten years later, in 1939, Nazi-controlled Germany invaded Poland. The Second World War had begun. During this war, some of the worst crimes in human history occurred, such as in Western Europe, 
where Jews were being exterminated by the thousands, or in the East, where Russian and German prisoners of war were treated with near equal hostility by their captors. In the Second World War, combat on the Eastern Front between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany was devoid of, of any real scrap of international law. And there was no, no pretense that anyone was paying attention to the Geneva Conventions or any of the basic rules of international war. That war on the Eastern Front saw the commission of crimes that really, the enslavement of entire peoples, the extermination of entire peoples, the extermination of prisoner of war populations, their use for medical experimentation against their will, the use of enforced slave labor, working to death, all of those things were done both by the Soviets to their Nazi prisoners and especially by Nazi Germany to their Soviet POWs. The most extreme example of German disregard for the Geneva Convention came already in 1941 and 42, uh, the first winter of the German invasion of the Soviet Union, when more than two million Soviet POWs are allowed to freeze and starve to death. Simply like that. Uh, no provisions were made for them. They were not given adequate food. Uh, they were not given adequate shelter. They died. As the war progressed, the Allies slowly gained momentum until they marched on Berlin in 1945, and the remaining German army surrendered. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. From New York to Moscow, the celebration rang out from the jubilant throngs of citizens flooding the streets. But the work was not over. Now the Allies were left to deal with those who had perpetrated these atrocious war crimes over the past six years. A war crimes commission decided that individual acts committed by the lower-ranking Nazis would be dealt with by military courts. For the surviving high-ranking Nazi officials, much international debate and diplomatic action yielded the idea of the Nuremberg Trials. Leading jurists and scholars and military personnel, and, and mostly civilians actually, from the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and the United States, and later France, who were later brought into the, the entire uh, system, devised uh, lists of who would be prosecuted, how they would be prosecuted, what would be their rights in terms of uh, presenting a defense for themselves. The four powers together come up with four counts, criminal counts which they apply against the top German leadership. Uh, and the first of these counts is um, conspiring to prosecute an aggressive war. And the second count is conducting an aggressive war. These two are obviously connected with one another. In any event, the parts of the Nuremberg trials that we pay most attention to now are uh, the third and fourth counts. One of them having to do with war crimes and one of them having to do with crimes against humanity. War crimes is probably the more easily explained of the last two offenses, but crimes against humanity is the more serious charge. Crimes against humanity entails extermination, enslavement, imprisonment, or torture in any way against any civilian population. Most defendants were found guilty and hanged, but one of the most important guilty parties, Hermann Goering, committed suicide the night before his hanging. Three were acquitted, and the rest sent to prison for a varying number of years. Though it is often difficult to see their application today, what with the nature of modern conflict being that of unconventional strategy involving guerrilla and terrorist warfare, the Geneva Conventions were a paramount breakthrough in international cooperation and diplomacy, and played a major role in the aftermath of World War II. For if there were no Geneva Conventions, there would not have been any justice at Nuremberg.